What the fuck is that? Whatever we want to talk about, we're going to talk about it. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of E4 Explicit Podcast. And today we have Jackie Bondanza. What's hey, up? Corey. Hey, Corey. How are you? Good. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks for letting me come to your house and bumfuck yeah. uh, New York. I and know. It's it far. is. It's really far. Yeah. But, but yeah, thanks for bringing your little mini studio yeah, to me. Yeah, I know. It's like Elf. It's in like one little bag. So yeah. it's like, it's convenient. Yeah, it's super convenient. Yeah. So who is Jackie Bondanza? First question. Let's just dive right into it. Who are you, <laughs> Corey? How much time do we have? Yeah, I know. Here? Yeah, like forty minutes. Forty. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. How do I summarize my life in forty minutes? Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I I work at Houndstown yep. pet care facility, but you know, my uh, career, I guess, if we're going to talk about yeah, yeah. you know, kind of career career stuff, keep it to career stuff yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Keep I, I kind of uh, want to know like the the evolution of of you because like i only i've only known you for the past like not even year right really yeah um and we've worked a lot like recently in the past like six months we've done a lot of stuff so like i only know like the houndstown jackie right you know what i mean i didn't know that you were you know an editor and like all this right. other great stuff so i just kind of curious of like how that all came about yeah so i i consider this kind of like my second life and both like on a personal and a professional level. So, so yeah, I went to school for journalism. I got a master's in journalism. And then when I graduated, I started um, working at like little magazines and newspapers. I lived in California for a while. That's kind of where I got started after I went to school. Mm -hmm. um, and slowly that just kind of evolved into uh, book editing. And I started working at Barnes & Noble as a, an associate editor like 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so I've had like a couple different jobs in book publishing, magazine publishing, newspaper publishing yeah. for all different types of genres. And I was always, I always loved it, but it was super frustrating because it pays absolute shit. Really? Nothing. I mean, you probably know as like a filmmaker, yeah. it's kind of the same thing. And yeah, we don't make anything. <laughs> exactly like i have worked at jobs where i have made nothing yeah and people in the field and people who work i would consider my mentors were like well that's just how the creative fields are like sometimes you have to work for no money and i remember meeting one of one of my editors once was like that's bullshit like you should never work for free unless you're getting something out of it yeah. you know yourself which yeah. is what i always took away from it so it was always fine for me but as I got older, you know, I, I, it became really frustrating that like I couldn't yeah. buy coffee, yeah. but I was like, you <laughs> know, struggling and like killing it. And, like, yeah. I'm, really like, hustling. I'm like on the poverty line yeah. and I, I want, I wanted to be, a, I wanted to have a professional career sure. and it was, I felt that it was really, um, it was just frustrating that I could not, I could get to that point professionally, like artistically, but, but, the, but I could never, I was never paid properly. Yeah, no. So it was yeah, so annoying. No, do you think that at all? Because of like, like were, were men getting paid for doing what you were doing? I don't know. I'm just like on the, the, the world I cup kick. I don't think so. And this is an interesting topic yeah. that like, I always, I always think about, you know, now that the past couple of years that we in society have started talking about the me too movement sure. and you know women's equality and yeah. i never experienced any sort of inequality i think that it was more the the nature of the business that 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 i was in sure. that you know but but certainly it was a man's world like you know back 15, 20 years ago when I first started working in publishing and journalism, like it definitely was a man's world. And it's interesting to see it change so quickly Yeah. Um, over the course of just like a very short time. But I think when it comes to pay, like it, it really was just like, this is just kind of like how it is. And it's really sad that people in that industry, in the creative arts are just kind of expected to get paid shit. Yeah. And and the value of what you're giving is so, so high. I is. mean, it's really, and when I would do, you know, when I was, I was working as an editor at Abrams, that was my last job as like a, an art book editor. And I would see the amount of money that the book was bringing in. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, what it costs to make. Sure. Um, 
has to be taken into consideration. But I just started being like, well, the numbers aren't really yeah. adding up for me. And yeah, like yeah. I had moved out all the way out in Bumblefuck, like you yeah, said, yeah. and I was commuting to the city. And I'm just like, I'm like 34 years old. Like I've got to start thinking about something different. Yeah. But I was stuck because I had worked in the industry for so long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you it was kind of that mindset where you have to stay at a job for so long and cl- make work your way up and you it's a very closed industry sure. so once you get your foot in the door if you leave you're never going back you're yet. never coming back but most creative p- professions are like that that's how filmmaking is like if right. if you don't know that's what like kind of that's why i made a shift and i used to be like like doing movies for free yeah. doing big projects that I saw the budgets for for free I mean right out of college I I was like I in college I was doing free shit all the time just because I wanted to come out of school with like a sick demo reel that I get yeah that's different but because like no one especially in in film no one ever has asked me oh well where'd you go to school let me see your right they're like oh well let me see your work can you do it or not yeah cool so like that I knew that so I took advantage of that but I did for the first like two or three years out of school I was pro bono like a motherfucker because yeah. I just, I couldn't say no to anything because I, I wanted to do it and I, I wanted to, I might meet someone on set that knows this person, this right. person. And it's like, it's so fucked up because like if, if you're a terrible filmmaker and I'm amazing and you know, Steven Spielberg and I know right. fucking nobody, you're you no know Jackie Bondanza. Yeah. I know Jackie <laughs> Bondanza. You're 100% getting a, a feature film in Hollywood way before I would ever even I know. Be- become a thought. So, yeah. which is unfortunate that it's like, it's looked at like that. And, uh, as far as like filmmaking is definitely, it's a, it's definitely always been like a man's world yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. And like up until recently, it's been like, you know, like, you know, women empowerment, which is awesome because yeah. like, there's so many talented, just filmmakers in general, whether they're male, female, doesn't matter to yeah. me, but right. it's always been kind of like, a guy is like, a, you know what I mean? It's like a guy, which is a weird thing. Cause I don't it's know not why, like though, because labor or like, you know, ham, I don't know. Right. I, I always wondered that in publishing, publishing is, is like an old school type of yeah. um, industry. Yeah. So it was always, I think, you know, when it first, w- when publishing houses first came about in like the twenties and thirties, I, I think if it would e- was even that long ago, I think it was just naturally dominated by yeah. men because yeah. that was just the culture, the nature of the culture back then. Sure. Especially back then, it was like, as a woman, yeah, it's like, it was like the man went to work yet. and the woman stayed home exactly. and took care of the yeah. kids. Yep. But it's crazy how much that carries through, and there's an, there's an undertone of that in a lot of industries still. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think women. You know, now we're seeing a lot more like women publishers and women which is which is fantastic but like i don't i never understood the reason for it because i never saw any overt like sexism from men in the publishing industry that was like women can't do this type thing i think it was the opposite like men i guess if i can generalize it like this like at least the men that worked at some of the public publishing houses I was at, they, they, it was like, they, they started to see women as like the huge, huge value, yeah. you know? Yeah, so yeah. they're like, well, if you can, you're like really smart and really bright and really talented. You can like, do this. You, you can do yeah. this. Like, let's have you do this. And, um, interesting. Yeah. So that's why I always like, you know, obviously I, there are in, tons of instances of like sexism and inequality yeah, in the and workforce. Hollywood is like fucking insane. Really? Yeah, like, but <sighs> when you come, you ever heard of a casting couch? Yeah. Okay, that's like a real fucking thing. Yeah. Like the fact that like, it's it's such a weird thing because like you have that douchebag director that is making a whatever film and then wants this actor to be in it and he'll totally like take advantage of his power and yeah. let this you know young aspiring actor because like I feel like it's more of like an ignorance on the woman's part because yeah. she doesn't know that like if she just put her head down and hustled and, and killed it for, for a long time, because it, it, it might take a long time, it may take a week to get right. discovered, right? Yeah. But, like, if you just did the work, you know, but I think, like, they might think it's, like, oh, and it's a, a quicker route it's to the end. top, or, it, you know, that's yeah. my foot in the door. I don't know. See, I, don't know I think that's a head. good point. I think that's where I see, I get frustrated by this whole, yeah. this whole just 
way of thinking that it's like it's a sexist world and it's it because i i think that if you have hustle and if you have enough confidence in yourself you don't need to you can bypass all of that yeah i know for the most part for the most part so yeah i get it people want to get cast or they want to you know get, get an opportunity but like you have to be strategic and you have to just have great work ethic and just fucking hustle. Yeah, just no, yeah. work hard yep. and you will get there. And not saying that like people that have experienced that have not done that. But I think like just exactly like you said, it's like the quickest way to get something that they want. Yep. And what I have seen and experienced is that like whenever something like that would come up, if it, you know, I've been on interviews and gone to interview people and professors when I was working at like a a college you know newspaper and I would have professors like I was interviewing them and they would be one of them I remember was like you're really pretty like would you want to go out like to lunch with me like in the middle of the interview and I was like no sorry like I I really just want to finish the interview and he was respectful I mean so you know, at that moment, I could have chosen to just yeah. drop that, gone to lunch with him, yeah. and probably gotten other things out of yeah, it professionally. Yeah, gotten the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right, that I needed. But yeah. I was like, no, like, I don't really see the need to... I'm not that desperate for, yeah. like, a scoop sure. that I am going to, like, go to lunch with you, which yeah. obviously means something else. Of course, yeah. He's not, <laughs> yeah he's not like, hey, let's go eat a fucking BLT. And right. It's like, no. And then we'll be friends. Yeah, like, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> literally the worst so i think like there are these subtle things in professional environments that where people can make different choices for the most part i'm not talking about like being like sexually assaulted or raped of course no yeah no that's i'm talking about like consensual of course yeah like you made the decision to do yeah no and i think you're right because like the I don't know the most, but like what I see and what I have seen Mm -hmm. and heard of in in in, at least in the film industry is like it's more of more of a like the Weinstein thing. When you have someone like Harvey Weinstein who is who at the time, I mean, of producers Right. He's I mean, it. Fucking are you kidding me? Like yeah. he's literally done every single like every cult classic you could think of, yeah. he's been a part of. You know what I mean? The Weinsteins. Like right. that's like Hollywood's elite. So yeah. when you're a young aspiring actress and you go into a room and you're with Harvey Weinstein who's like made billions upon billions of dollars in yeah. this industry and he's telling you, this is how it goes. Uh, like, okay, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I think I know. it's that's a little. It's not like I feel like it might not happen like that in the publishing world. But when you have someone at that stature and power, and they're telling you this is the norm, yeah, and you don't know other like ways to get in. It, like, if you haven't yeah. had a discussion with someone, and be like, no, like, hustle, hustle, hustle. Go on sets all the time. Fucking just kill it and just put yeah. your head down. And you might meet someone, and you might not. Right. You know, if you haven't well, been told that. It's, I don't know. I think it's like... I know, but I just think that it's like, isn't it common sense kind of like that that you don't have to subject subject yourself to that? I, to, I, I totally agree. I think it's I like... I mean, I just yeah. don't think it's something you have to be told. Yeah, no, I was never told. Okay, if to, somebody... If a man asks you out to dinner while you're doing... While you're being on the job yeah. and being like, this is what you should say. I was just like, no. That was yeah. just my natural instinct. But I guess... I don't know if some people, I think like with the Weinstein thing to me, everybody saw that not, it's not fair to say everybody, the majority of the people that part, that, that were victims of that in some way got something out of it. Oh, sure. So they engaged in it because they wanted something for themselves. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think that that's the part that when we talk about like Me Too and, and sex sexism sometimes that factor gets left out of the conversation. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying that like Harvey Weinstein is right by yeah. any stretch no, he's of the a piece imagination. Of shit, for sure, 100% yes. piece of shit. He's done other things besides like right. like jerking off in front of people like randomly like he's a fucking Yeah, he's piece a weirdo of shit. and yeah. he's a douche yeah. and yeah, he should not impose that thought on yeah, impressionable yeah. people that yeah. like this is the way that you get exactly. it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also a a piece of responsibility on on the other half yeah. on the other half sure. no, i agree like gwyneth sure. paltrow she she rejected his advances yeah, there's a and bunch of people and, that did that yeah right so 
So why didn't she step out and like go? Why didn't she go to the New York Times? Like why did it yeah. take 10, 20 years for this to come out? Because she wanted something for herself. Yeah. She did not want to ruin her reputation. Because her especially career. back then, it probably would have been like Gwyneth Paltrow who and versus exactly Harvey Weinstein. No, I get it. You're right. right. And that's like that's but what kind of what kind of frustrates me is like the. It sucks that the, I know it's hard. I, I, I've never been a victim of anything like that, but I'm sure like if you're a victim of something like that and uh, you know, it's, you don't want to come right out, especially if it's someone like that stature, Of course. but it's like, yeah, like 20, 30 years go by. And then like, I don't know. I just feel like it's, it's totally like valid that it comes out and it takes a bunch of people, but it kind of like, like with the, what's his name uh, from house of cards? Like, Oh um, yeah, Kevin, Kevin Spacey is probably one of my top three favorite actors of all yeah. time. Like I was, I knew professionally that he's a fucking weirdo. I've been really uh, my, uh, absolutely my friends, my friend, one of my friends I went to school with was like the head PA on House of Cards, yeah. and like legit, like like Spacey was has always been known as uh, bisexual. Always been interested in men. Huh. Always like, unfortunately, I'll, like be on set and he'll go to craft services and grab the fucking PA's ass or like you know like un, uh, totally unprofessional right. things and yeah. should not happen. But it's not like out of fucking nowhere. Everyone's like, oh, Kevin Spacey is this monster. It's like no, this man's always been like this. Right. It's just now thirty years later he we want to talk. He got caught. Well, he get, he's been caught. It's just no one has stepped up right and had gone against you know. Hollywood like that. It's right. always been like, oh, shh, that's Kevin Spacey. Shh, that's Harvey Weinstein, which I right. get, but and no one wants to rock the boat no. for themselves. No. But I just find a disappointment in it, like it is, yeah. humanity for that. Yeah, like, no, I agree. I know it takes a really strong person to be able to be like, I am willing to risk my career. Yeah, to do this and to step out and to speak out about how wrong this is. Yeah, but. But it's just like, then I look at these people just differently. And yeah. I'm like, well, you knew all of this? Like, you, I know. Like, That's how could part. you, how could you know this and not at least, at least try and prevent it in some way? Or yeah. at least I know Gwyneth Paltrow went and told somebody, her agent or something. Yeah. And, Which but, is, her agent was probably like, let's not fucking right. go So everybody's road. like in on this scam. And yeah. then when it blows up, everyone's like, Oh, well, Oh my, Oh my God. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'm, and then they jump in as the victim. Of course, and, yeah. and I totally get that. It takes, it's hard to come out and forward yeah. like initially as an individual. But I think the most admirable people are the people who risk their own happiness or career or opportunities sure. to, that's like a real kind of martyr. And yeah. I just think that with all this going on, I haven't, I haven't seen anybody that's come out and really like, done that yeah. and been that person for from the, beginning. the rest of us. Yeah. From the beginning, not like 30 years later. Oh exactly. yeah. He touched my penis too. You know what I mean? Or like, right. like, like why yeah. didn't you say that 30 years yeah. ago? You know, but I say that knowing that it is difficult course, to, yeah. to say it, those things. It makes it a lot easier when other someone else has done it. Of first. course, yeah, exactly. And it's like that. I think it's just it, what it comes down to is the stature of people that they're that they're talking about. Is anyone going to believe me? Versus this yeah. completely household name, famous actor, or famous yeah. exec. You know what I mean? Like no, that I understand. That's that's. I think that's probably the, the embarrassment. There's just so many yeah. things that go into it. So I get why not. But then I can see the argument of like, yeah, but like none of this, this all could have been prevented decades ago. Like, right. I mean, it's not like, uh, what's his name? Uh, who's that? The weird actor um, with the glasses uh, or the a an actor. He's a director. Um, Woody, the oh, Woody Allen. Woody Allen. Yeah. Woody Allen's a fucking creep. And yeah. he's always been a creep. Right. Yeah. And it's just recently in the last five, six years, that it's like <gasps> Woody Allen, this guy who makes these like right. light and funny. F it's like. Because I think people. <laughs> People want to view these people as they don't want to yeah. like they're they're getting they want to view them as they have always viewed them. Yeah. So it's very difficult. It's hard to, to look at them. somebody like that. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my own life and yeah. with non-famous people like. Yeah. People don't want to believe the truth yeah. about who someone really is. Exactly. And that's to me sad. And it's a reflection of the individual. Sure. To 
and I think it's just selfish yeah. to say, well, what do I, oh, well, but he makes good movies yeah. or he was talented. Okay. But that's like secondary yeah, to like that. the fact that he's yeah. a huge fucking creep yeah. and he's not a good human being. Exactly. So like, why don't we as a culture recognize people who are not good human beings? I agree. I know I catch myself sometimes. Like when we talk, when me and Corinne will talk about like, cause we were like house of cards was like amazing. Yeah. And we loved it. And then, I mean, cause like I said, I've always liked Spacey, but like, I would sometimes catch myself I'm like, he's so fucking talented. Like, how? Like, yeah. But then I'm like, but he's a piece of shit. Like, he's a terrible person. I like, know it's hard. It's, I get it. You know, I know, especially when you're if you're in like and you can appreciate like I can appreciate a good actor. Like, he's right. you know when you grow up and you see all these, you know, you grow up watching these things, so you're like you're attached to it emotionally in a different yeah, way. So when you hear true. about it, it's hard to believe it. Like the right. f- fucking R. Kelly shit. Yeah. Did you watch the documentaries about him? No. Whole surviving R. Kelly. No, bro. There's one about Michael Jackson, too. My sister watched it and she's like, I am so creeped out. She was like really um, affected by it. Really? Yeah. Finding Neverland? Yeah. Or leaving Neverland? Something like that. Yeah. She thought it was like really, um, it was really troubling. We watched it. You should watch it. It's it's kind of, uh, it's definitely polarizing because all documentaries are are always one-sided. I mean, this man's dead. So like. Right. It's not like he can be like, hey, hold on a second. You know, he's, exactly. he's dead. So, right. but it's weird because like the two people in that doc, the two kids that, that were out, that are coming out now are like, um, they're the ones that in 2005, when Michael Jackson was in big trouble, um, yeah. they actually came out and testified that he never did right. anything. I remember that. Yeah. And, and they also like people will come out after these docs are made and like, they just came out with like a couple months ago this person looked at the blueprints of when neverland ranch was made Mm -hmm. and the dates aren't even lined up to what the dates are that these kids said that they were getting uh molested in neverland ranch okay Um, so it's like neverland ranch wasn't even built when these kids were talking about it so like which is subject i don't fucking know and i don't really care to be like oh you know this right michael jackson 100 percent has issues and and has been a you know he's kind of a creep and stuff like that all the time whether he's talented or not he's still like done some sketchy things but when you watch that documentary you want to wring the fucking parents necks yes you want to kill them they're like yeah yo if my kid if i knew michael jackson had bells from like one part of his house to the other to his bedroom to alert him when people were coming down the hallway and then like his camp and my kid would ask me oh god i just want to stay with michael in his room yeah let's fucking leave i agree Get no the fuck out of here but i think again like the parents were getting something out of 100%. this for themselves and this 100%. is like another problem with parenting yeah. not to like go on to that no, topic but, yeah, it's, but it's like <laughs> there's selfishness about it yep. where the ki- parents are probably like well this is th- my kid gets jackson. to stay with michael jackson yeah. but like again just uh, unwillingness to accept an individual for who they really are yeah. and yeah, it's a disappointment to recognize when people are not, they're not who you think they are. No. But it happens so much in life. It's like, it, it really is disappointing. Like, is. across all, everything, not just celebrities. Yeah. Like, I've just found that I think that's like one of the most disappointing things is like, like thinking somebody out. is yeah. something and then realizing that they're not. They're a shitty person or they're, they're, they're not who they like are projecting themselves to be. Yeah. So I think there's no real winner in that stuff. Like the, the one kid that's in a doc, he ended up becoming like the, he was a choreographer for, for NSYNC, Britney Spears, like every fucking boy band. Yeah. The, the dude made right, like. Right, I remember that kid, yeah. Ki- killed it, you know what I mean? Like right. the only reason why he got to that stage was because of his relationship with Michael Jackson. Yeah. Unfortunately. You know, whatever happened, happened. But it's like, yeah. you're right. It's like. But like, what would he. I just think there are, there are so many subtle moments in life throughout your career or throughout your childhood or just personally and professionally yeah. where you can make. You can make a choice. And the choice will be, make a huge difference yeah. in your Either in way. your life. Yeah. So like for me, I I started kind of getting sick of working in publishing. I wanted something different. Sure. And I started just kind of like, but I was so stuck. I was like stuck in a rut. It was just in a bad place. Yeah. I was just like, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to keep doing this, I guess. Yeah. And then I got this dog, Maggie, and I had it for a couple of months and I just moved out here from the city yeah. and I was commuting to the city and I needed 
um, a dog trainer and I needed somewhere to bring her while I was at work yeah. for 12 hours, 12, 15 hours a day. Yeah. So I Googled dog trainers out here and Mike Gould comes up. <laughs> Mayor has Yeah. That. So which, I, s- which if you don't know my gold episode <laughs> seven, watch it. Yeah. Yeah. And wonder why I all of a sudden was like attracted to this yeah. fucking psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> but what does that say about me? I don't know. Yeah. So now I know the real Jackie. So shut yeah. it down. Like this is over. Yeah. Drop the mic. Yeah. Uh, so I I went and brought my dog because my dog had just like gotten into a fight with my other dog, and I I thought I was gonna have to give her back, and yeah. I was like devastated. Yeah. So I just kept like kind of. Sp- spiraling like I was in a bad place personally I was in a bad marriage I was in a bad kind of professional place and now I just like moved all the way out into bumblefuck I didn't know anybody I just bought a house with someone that I realized after we bought the house that I didn't really want to be married to and I was like oh my god my life sucks (laughs) (laughs) let me google someone that can help me yeah Mike Gold yeah no but literally I know this sounds like so cheesy and cliche but like the second that I met Mike my entire life changed wow and if I I feel like if I wasn't if I didn't like have my antennas on I like Mike always says this Yeah. yeah or if if I wasn't like enough aware of how unhappy I was if I didn't have that much self-awareness I would have just kept my head down and continued to go. But I was like, I'm going to start poking around for something. Sure. I don't know where I'm going to find it. But I know that there's like something floating around out there, yeah. you know, that's mine. But mm-hmm. I just don't know how to get it yet. And this then this dog comes into my life. And, you know, she she got into a really bad fight with my other dog. And, and, and of course, that's like devastating. And, you know, when you yeah. have dogs, it's like okay, what am I going to, you know, my dog doesn't get along with other dogs and I just got, I have another dog in my yeah. house. What like this doing? is super yeah. stressful. Yeah. And then I felt like horrible because I didn't know what to do. So anyway, I go and bring her to Houndstown and I met Mike and like my entire life changed for the better at that moment. So, so my life changed completely, both personally, professionally, like on every single level when I met this person, Mike, yeah. who I like, you know, it, it's funny I, I always say like it, he would never be a person if i had to go on like match.com or something yeah you know obviously like i i he, he wouldn't fit my profile right yeah. he's like 60 an old man <laughs> he's got you know so he, but it's just funny i think if you are open and just kind of like t- take take time to like cons just kind of welcome things and welcome opportunities. And you, you, at least for me, I saw that like none of this really matters. Yeah. All of this outside bullshit and social norms and age differences and, um, you know, what society says you should do by the time you're 30 or 35. It's like, it just, for some reason, the minute that I met him, it just, all of that just melted away. And, um, so I ended up, you know, g- 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 dumping my husband and like getting how quick. Like, no, like, well, wasn't we, like our marriage home, was already like, over, honestly. And I was just kind of like, just I was just stuck in yeah. a in a rut, and I I couldn't I couldn't get you, out. You couldn't and voice think, it though, because you I, just bought a house. So I would think if yeah. my if my wife and I just bought a house, I'd be like, I know things are you know whatever. So I feel guilty about that of because course, yeah. I because like what we were talking about earlier, where I I, I think people people stay in things they stay in certain structures whether it's personally professionally they have engaged in relationships professionally sure. like with harvey weinstein yeah, yeah. or personally in a in a marriage to get what they want and or what they think that they can get out of it yeah. so that's what happened to me and i was just you know i stayed because i was too afraid to leave yeah. and i really just didn't sure. I, I didn't know any i didn't know any different yeah um and Which is a common thing. I feel it like it is common. It's hard to voice your what you want or what you don't want or what you know because you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. It's it's a it's a touch. Yeah, event. I just like kept getting myself in deeper. I'm like, sure. I'll get another dog. That'll help. I'll buy a house. That'll yeah. help. And all of it just like made me feel a lot more like underwater. Yeah, and then you're even more invested, so it makes it even harder. To, yeah, it know, was. It was out. extremely difficult, but. It was so necessary for me to move into, you know, I, I just think for me, 
I was like living my life in black and white up until that moment. Wow. And the moment that I stepped foot into the Houndstown parking lot, <laughs> literally yeah. my life, I started to live my life in color. In green and like in green bright, and blue. Yeah. <laughs> in green, bright green and bright blue. But it was just like so refreshing and honest. And it was just an immediate like connection to somebody hmm. um, that really transformed any any first dimensional sure any like yeah. anything first dimensional it yeah. was like on another level so so i ended up leaving my career as an as a book editor in the city because i saw that mike had you know he had houndstown and he had three locations and i thought he's got such a great brand yeah. and a great opportunity yep. i want to help him do this so it just kind of naturally evolved uh into that so i started working at the corporate store at first and helped kind of get the profits up there. And then over the next couple of years, we just started growing the business yeah. and I it just kind of like backed into it, but I never, ever, ever saw myself as a leader. So, and I think like all through high school, college, grad school, I always thought that leaders were like, you know, they were kind of, you were either born a leader or you weren't. Yeah. So for, to be a leader, you had to be like assertive and aggressive. And yeah. I think naturally maybe that's why men are leaders True. more often because women tend not to be like that naturally yeah. for the most part. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, I can't lead a business. Like I don't, I don't know anything about leadership, but what I found is that like, if you're, if you're passionate enough and if you're knowledgeable enough about what you're doing, then it's it comes naturally yeah. and i think some of the soft skills that i have it, you know i tend to be not i'm not like an assertive too too much of an assertive oh, yeah. person I'm, I'm more kind of like empathetic and i take things personally those things are challenges when it comes to leadership because there are times where you have to make hard decisions and you know you have <sighs> to put the development of the business first yep. even if it means making someone unhappy or letting somebody go but you know, those are all things that have served me well in my leadership role now. And yeah. I think at the end of the day, I think the characteristic that I value the most when it comes to leadership is empathy and yeah. being able no, to yeah. empathize with other people. And I think you can get so far in life without that. And certainly a lot of people have done it and yeah. a lot of leaders, but they always fucking get caught. You yeah. know, they always, they always crash and burn yeah. at some point whether it's 10 years into their leadership 20 30 or at the end of their life yeah so it's been an interesting it's been an interesting ride but you know i would say that like you always just have to like have your have your antennas on and be able to kind of just like see see take advantage of certain things that present to you sure. in life yeah. even though it doesn't seem like it would fit into your box yeah but no that's i totally agree with that yeah definitely i, I had a similar situation too and like that's how that kind of it's like literally the same mm -hmm. fucking thing so like i totally agree with you on that and like i feel like leadership is like you're like you're definitely a leader because, like, everyone obviously comes to you for things. I mean, all the franchisees, like, I see it all the time. Like, they have to. They have to. Yeah, they have to. But, like, you're, they don't have any choice. <laughs> they don't. But, like, you're not, like, you're not, it's not like a dictatorship. You know what I mean? No. It's very, you're, you're very empathetic. You're, because also, I feel like since you say that you haven't maybe always been a leader, you've always, you, you've been other things. And obviously, right. so you can kind of put yourself in people's shoes when they're going through something. Like, yeah, you know, I'm not just going to be like, no, it has to be done this way. No. Da, da, da. You're like, right. no, I get it. Like, I, I probably, you've probably felt like that or you've probably been in their shoes so you can kind of relate to them, which I think, to your point, is like a must to be a leader is to have 100%. empathy because it's like if you can't feel what the other person's mm -hmm. going through and then you just throw commands at them, they're definitely not going to be effective and they're not going to, no. they're not going to do the job at task. You know what I mean? They're not going right. to be able to do what you're asking them to do. So. Uh, totally. And I've found it so much more effective that if you just try and understand where people are coming from, like if somebody's, if one of our franchisees is upset about something or they yeah. don't want to follow a certain policy, I always think to myself, okay, what, what, what are, what is their barrier? Cause this doesn't have to do with this. It has yeah. to do with something else that is either personal to them or they feel like they're not in control mm -hmm. or they feel like 
their ego is being yeah. kind of challenged. Sure. So what is it? So I always try and take a moment to try and like psychoanalyze where the other person is coming from. And I think it's, it's definitely, it's definitely important because I then try to relate to them on that level and yeah. kind of like address their fear or their hesitation in a way that, um, gets to the root of the issue and not, you know, like you said, and not just not like, a be like thing, here's, yeah. yeah, you're doing this and I don't care what you think. Like yeah. as a leader, you always have to care what people think. You don't always have to act on it, mm, yeah, of course. but you have to take it into consideration yeah. hear to be sure. effective. You know, it's, it's not, it's not fair to the people that you're leading. If you don't take their fears, their anxieties, their thoughts yeah. and, and their concerns into consideration. You're so, right. so you really are a therapist too. I, I, I feel like I am sometimes and I'm fine with Which that. Which is good, you know, cause like, I feel like when you put yourself on a, it's not, it's a business hundred percent. Yeah. First it's a business, but like, that's why I think you guys are doing so well and blowing up so quickly is because it's more of a personal yeah. thing. It's not like, you know, they're, they're, they're owning a franchise of Houndstown, but like, they're almost like an extended family now. Yeah, it's not like, are. it's not like a. You work for us and da da da. It's no. like no, like hey, welcome to the family. You guys are always joking and like I've I've had more laughs with you and Mike than I've had with anyone that I've worked professionally with ever. Yeah. So like, it it never feels. It makes the work ten times easier. Easier. It's so I think so too. Great. Yeah, but it's genuine. It's like 100%. that's how we genuinely feel. Exactly. And yeah. um, you know, anybody that's coming into a franchise, I've or any business, and I think at the end of the day, people just want to feel like they can trust yeah. you yeah, and definitely. the people that they're working with and yep. they don't want to feel like you are going to pull a rug out from under them yes. at any time. Yep. And I think trust and communication are like the keys to everything. And it takes a lot of work yeah. every day it does. to form and facilitate those relationships with people. But like, that's what I try and lead with every day. You know, people don't always respond the way that I wish they would sometimes, but that's fine. That's okay. Like yeah. I feel like I need to at least lay that as the foundation for my leadership. And then however people respond, that's great. How, yeah. You know? So, but you know, for me, it's a little bit of a, my transition from being working in editing and journalism to doing this was really difficult because I, it was always, you know, worked in an environment where I was very autonomous. It was just me. I didn't, I never had to really manage people and I managed people here and there, but I never like led a like whole a group of, yeah, group of people depending on you financially too, because you know, these franchisees yeah. are giving you tens of thousands of dollars, hoping yeah. that you know what the fuck you're talking about, that it's going to work. Exactly. You know, so. so I now have to have enough confidence in myself yeah. to convince people to take that step yeah to trust you so yeah exactly so um so it was a difficult transition for a couple of years but and, and you know there were moments where i was like i totally fucked this up like yeah. i'm not gonna make it <laughs> yeah. guys you yeah. know i need but i never let that show yeah and i just like worked not. through it on on my own and and um it really what it comes down to i think is a lack of i just wasn't like confident enough sure. in myself in that moment um but I think, you know, the value of self-reflection is just endless. You, yeah. you can never have enough self-reflection. I think bringing this all back to one one theory, that, you know, this whole topics we're talking about today, I think it's a, a lot of the issues and challenges in professional environments today are because people lack self-reflection self yeah. and the ability to be like, do I really want to engage in this or is there another way for me? Or, you know... <laughs> Yeah. Do I, do I really want to present myself as a, you know, a couch or well, whatever Harvey Weinstein would be considered? Like, like yeah, do I really want to be this to, you know, potential new people yeah. coming into the business? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. on his side, yeah. I mean, like, or oh, is yeah. there. So obviously that people like that have a complete lack of self-reflection at all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and they think they're a god or they think they're this. Yeah. And their yeah, egos no. get out of way out of whack yeah. and out of control and they become almost like subhuman yeah no you know? yeah 100 yeah, yeah they're not they're not normal mm -hmm. like that's it's totally abnormal to to right. feel the, or do those things especially like to not willing people i don't know it's fucking weird 
it is weird and the, i think the the way the brain works is is like yeah the brain's insane pretty crazy yeah i know what you can convince yourself you are 100 percent. the brain is insane yeah. it's so complex yeah. it's not even like right and the fact that like it's certain parts are like completely untapped sometimes and mm-hmm. like I don't know. It's just the brain is weird. Like it is. It's interesting. And I've had like thoughts before. I think it's like an intuitive feelings that if you are not if you're not like tuned in and you you don't understand how to accept those feelings and those thoughts then yeah. and how to act on them sometimes like they go by the wayside. So yeah. I feel like a lot of times with people especially as the society is becoming more focused on just all the superficial shit. Sure people don't they're not listening to things that are being told to them by whoever the universe god whatever you believe in you're not listening to that like kind of like force that's giving you that intuitive feeling so i try to always be in tune with that and i think i never was like until that moment when i met mike and started coming to houndstown for some reason that just like opened it for me so like it's almost like just going with your gut almost going like, you know, with your yeah, gut yeah, yeah. Just and like, you know what that doesn't feel right or sound right or you know instead of overthinking it or yes. not thinking about it at right. all just be like what was your first like reaction or yeah. feeling to it and then spit that out or exactly or and it's difficult that. because you have to train your brain yeah to follow that yeah and the brain is basically designed to protect not you. to do yeah, that exactly yeah so you have to like override your brain yeah, no, thoughts yeah. and that is very scary <laughs> yeah no i think it's like i was talking to Craig the other day i, I i'm not 100 percent sh- like how like i don't think you can drown yourself like really? if you i don't think so because your brain will not not allow you to i think i, I could be okay. completely fucking wrong yeah but i'm i'm like pretty sure like you can't like I can't put my face underwater and try to drown myself, right? Because my brain will just set off all the alarms. Right. No, this is not good. And then my, it'll like make me like nope. And then I'll like you right. know what I mean? Yeah. But if someone's forcing yeah. me down, obviously right. I can't help that. But y- you ever thought about that? Yeah. Like you know what I mean? Like the brain is kind of like it's, it's there to like it's always trying to like protect you and right. like you save you from these crazy right. experiences and stuff. So like. Yeah. And that's why I think going back to the franchisees that people become fearful of things that they don't know. So it's like they're they're I get it. Their brain is trying to protect them from something they don't know or they're anxious about. But sometimes if you're if you're not aware of that, it it just I just think the value of self-awareness is like cannot be understated, especially in a leadership position. But just in life in general like on a personal level for me i was like totally lacking self-awareness and then once it came yeah, it like, was like holy hit like shit a fucking Mac truck. Yeah, yeah i was like okay like and there's some hard things to accept about yourself sure, when you yeah. go down that road but and it's it's you know not always like positive things but but at human, the end and that's yeah you know what you have to but look where you're through. at now though like you're much happier you're oh yeah you know you're doing what like like that thing you were talking about earlier is like there's something like i just don't know what it is i can't put yeah. my finger on it that i want to do i think you've probably found it um, yeah but i have a question yeah so when you left like the publishing world mm-hmm. i think you dodged a bullet honestly be- well, not only just because of like your happiness but like yeah i feel like like that the doesn't written. really matter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, yeah, yeah, happiness, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's about making money or lack of. In your case, um, I'm kidding because yeah. you said you made no money. No, I know. make more money picking up dog shit. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Writing books, so. thousand percent. So, but like that is like I feel like it's a dead industry anyway. Yeah. So I think like you know what I mean. Like yes. everything's going digital. Every like very seldom, not seldom. It, people still there's still libraries and stuff like that. But yeah. like. I just it's think true. you're not like it's a dying art. And yeah, it's, it's really, really sad. Um, but I think the publishing houses, the traditional ones just kind of are just they just kind of grasping at straws. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. Over the next 10 years, I think it's going to change <laughs> no, drastically. Amazon, Amazon is it's going to end grocery stores it's yeah. gonna it's gonna end all of those things where you don't have to go out and i mean books are awesome like i have a bunch of books i don't even fucking read so like <laughs> but i got like a bunch of good books but i just yeah. never read them right um but like it's so funny because i'm like you know what i'd be nice to just read like an actual book and i'm like right i have a fucking see i love that yeah. i i still read a you, ton of books. you appreciate those yeah. things but like the masses they would don't. rather read it on a i have a kindle never use it it's always dead um 
I try it on my iPhone, but I, I don't even like, I'm not a reader. I'm yeah. a visual person. Right. So like I need, I'd rather watch a video yeah. about something or listen to an audio book or right. a podcast or something. But like, that's how like, th- there's so many different mediums, Yeah. but like, I think you dodge a fucking bullet because like, I know. It, not only were you probably not killing it like financially anyways, yeah. like it probably wasn't going to get like much better, you no, know, because, you know, no. if it, they turned everything digital and, and then there goes your jobs. I don't know. I yeah, just, no, it's true. Um, and the publishing industry as a whole is definitely very outdated and they're not yeah. the leaders of those companies are not savvy at all no, they're, they're just a bunch of old people that like are stuck are. in their ways and yeah you know, maybe are. once they get out of there you know right maybe Some but, new blood can come in and but what are they gonna do they're gonna turn everything digital they're not gonna yeah. like let's why are we wasting money on printing these fucking yeah. things when we can do it for nothing and make it digital and instantly give it to people yeah it's fucking crazy it's true what, yeah did you see any of that when you were there were you like you know, would you ever think of that? Or did you ever like see like people like, Hey, like, you know, like the water cooler or like, <laughs> Hey guys, like, <laughs> guess what? Amazon's coming around and we're not going to be here any longer. I don't know. Is that like, um, or is everybody just like, no, I think that delusional. I think that people are delusional <laughs> and I think that there, I've never seen a group of people with such high egos without work in the publishing industry. For some reason they think that they, for the most part, that they have like this talent, it's prestige. Thing. That it's a prestige, especially yeah. at the last publishing house I worked at, which was like an art book publisher. So they, so they're artsy were, and yes. like smart, intellectual, and they're like the written very, word. very intellectual. Great, and that's the worst. You know, it, yeah. So they had no vision for. They they almost completely rejected the notion that books are going to become digital and it's like this <sighs> this like ins- they want to create this like insulated place and that's why i think they're just grasping at you know at straws and of course there's there's a place for you know beautiful coffee table art books of course, but yeah. you also have to know your audience yeah. like you got to know that like kids these days are they don't value those things no. so no i agree it's sad it's sad but i think again lack of self-awareness sure uh, and the the person that's in that leadership position now they're just gonna ride this out yeah until the end they're yeah. gonna jump ship right before it crashes and burns so yeah. they can leave a legacy and get out not feeling super guilty yep and then it's gonna they're gonna let it crash and burn and like that's the kind of culture of the publishing industry yeah um there's like high turnover it's very like jump around to different places and really you, you can't really move up in a company it's very uh, it's political in the sense that like you have to you have to know people 100%. completely yeah. to get even in the door. Yeah, so no, I agree. Um, but yeah, it's a weird it's a weird space, That's and and they don't they're they're it, they're not very they don't have a lot of uh they don't have a, the ability to kind of look to the future. Yeah, they're not forward thinkers. They're not, they're like, not forward thinkers. What's gonna happen to our no. business in twenty years when? Everyone lives in fucking Jello and they're in the Matrix. No, and you know, you know, right? And you know why? Because the people running it love books. Yeah. They're not business. People. Of course not. Yeah. They love art, and you know they value art yep. and they value bookmaking, which of course is, I think, is phenomenal. Yeah, of course you appreciate but it, but you need someone in there that's say that's gonna say, hey, listen, guys, in five years, yeah. like we're all this is gonna go downhill unless we start looking to the future. So. Sure. I think that that lack of vision yeah, just, overall in that industry is like, it's slowly taking a nosedive. Really? Yeah. That way, like Blockbuster and Toys, like, yeah. you don't want to be Blockbuster. You don't, you know, you know like exactly. they passed, you know, they passed on Netflix. Really? Like they had an option. Yeah. They were like supposed to, and then Toys R Us, like totally dropped the ball and like everything you can buy at Toys R Us, you literally were able to buy on Amazon. Yeah. So they, that's why they went out of business a couple right. of years ago. But like, but like, what are the leaders of these companies fucking doing? That's what I'm if saying. they're yeah. not yeah. sitting in their office yeah. every day saying, okay, let me look six months ahead, a year ahead. That's your job as yeah. a leader. Yeah. Like, as like a CEO, you should know like, yeah, what's happening, what of things are. Yeah. What are the trends? What like, is, they look at Amazon 10, 20 years ago. Pff, the fuck is that? You know, that's nothing. That's not, people yeah. aren't going to, aren't going to want to sit in their house in order 
groceries, toilet paper, books, yeah. fucking movies on demand. They're not. It's not going to happen. They're going to want to yeah. come out, physically drive to Blockbuster, yeah. rent a gu- that used to be. I, but see, it's a thing. Same way with you with books. I'm the same way with movies. Right. I one thousand percent would rather go to a theater. Really? Sit down, absolutely. Yeah. You don't. Ex- you cannot experience a movie on right. your phone yeah. like you can experience it even at your home. I don't care what sound system you have. It's not the way that those right. things are shot and made. They're made for the big screen. They're yeah. not made for a fucking television right. and definitely not made for an iPhone. So right. I, I go to the movies. I haven't done it. I've done it late. I've done it once lately, but I used to go to movies by myself all the time. Yeah. Like on like a fucking Tuesday, I'll go watch like a whatever movie just yeah. because like I appreciate that because I growing up, that's what led me to be into videos and, and right. films. You have like an emotional connection 100%, to it. hundred percent. Yeah. I'm like, you know, when I hear, you know, if seeing Jurassic Park in theaters hearing the roar of the fucking T-Rex like I was like <laughs> oh my god right. like and I think that, it like you lets know, you live in your child 100%, you know 100% yeah. yeah and I can't when I watch a movie at home I'm like <laughs> this is I'm all bougie with it I'm like oh this is not like 60 fucking feet screen you know right. like yeah. it's not it's it's not it's the not same. The same way with books. Are like yeah. you can appreciate a hard copy sitting down, re- yeah. whatever the fucking I don't know, reading it or yeah. Yeah, obviously reading it. But <laughs> you know what I mean. Like you can yeah. appreciate those things. Same way I can with film. And people are like, oh, well, I just want to stream it on my phone. I'm like, why would you watch Avengers Endgame on your phone? Yeah. That's probably one of the biggest fucking movies ever. Right. And you're gonna watch it on a fucking. Right. Five inch screen with no speakers, basically. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Right. Like, <laughs> it's stupid, you know? But yeah. in, in 15, 20 years, theaters are going to be fucking I done, know. You know? But, which is unfortunate. I but. just feel like in this world, we're becoming so superficial and, and one dimensional yeah. that all of these, like, I call it third dimensional, like, all of these third dimensional aspects about life art, movie making, book making, um, are. They're so devalued. Yeah, they you are. You know, and they it's really it's not because it's like a conscious choice from people. I think I think it's just like naturally evolving away from that. Yeah, and we're becoming like so like so superficial, and it's really a shame. It's it a is. huge shame because if you don't have that in you, I think everybody as a ch- I mean the ch- children are born with curiosity yeah. and you know, a, a, a want, a wanting to color and, and play make believe and pretend yep. and write books and, yep. you know, do, do all these creative things. And then it slowly just becomes, you know, it just kind it of goes like away, goes away just, as you grow pff, up. And it's just such a shame. Same thing happened to me. I was, I was always making fucking movies and yeah. this and as a kid. And I still did it when I was older, but I was like, I can't make money doing that. And then right. I was like, wait, maybe I can. So then yeah. I went to school, which I should have never went to school. But really? no. Yeah, yeah. So I would, I should have never, like, I'm glad I went to film school because I met, like, people that I work with yeah. in the industry and I met great people. But it's a waste of money because, really? I, yeah, I learned more on YouTube and doing than I did in school. Right. Like, I tell people all the time, if they ask me about film school, I'm like, don't go. Like, wow. especially now. Like, so expensive too. It's so hundred grand for three years, and yeah. like the school I went to is now like out of business and like fucking got sued by the government and all that. Really? This, yeah. I went to the art institute. Like nothing like prestigious. Like it was like it's an art school, but it was yeah. like f- for profit. It was a fucking joke. Okay. But like if you go to like USC or like UCLA, like you know those yeah. big schools, you're gonna meet people. You're gonna yeah. have um, experiences and opportunities that. I definitely never had going to the school that I went to, but like, I don't know. I just think it's a, a sham. Mm, um, it is kind of, I, it's yeah, Spielberg, Tarantino. They're all high, high school dropouts. Like, so right. They can do that shit. Anyone. Can. Right. But, yeah. but like the, like back to the movie thing, like well, I was a projection projectionist. Um, you know what that is? I'm assuming you ran the projection. Yeah. So you, no, not the project, the projector. Yeah. At the movies, at the movies. Yeah. So like when you see the, yeah. So like I used to do that at the movie theater in Maryland and then they switched to digital. Oh. So like my job was not needed. Oh. So I like, well, they're like, you can either go like quit or we can put you in like concession. And I'm like, oh, so I worked in session for like a, a week. I was like, fuck this. That's so a I, lame transfer. Yeah. I'm like, no, cause I, it was awesome. Cause I'm like literally like touching the film. Yeah. Like, uh, it was like, I was like, Ugh. like it was right. amazing. So, um, when they did that, I, I learned a lot about like the movie business. It kind of like rubbed me the wrong way. Like, did you know that movie theaters make so if a if a movie does a billion dollars, the actual movie theater makes zero from that. 
Really? That's why your concessions are so high. They only make the money off the concession. They don't make any money off of the profit. Yeah, the profit of the movie. So if Avengers does a billion dollars, they get zero of that. They get But how do they then choose what movies they're going to show in their theater? They choose the, the biggest movies. So like, and it's not really them choosing. It's like, you want these movies to play yeah. because you want the amount of people to come see it so right. they can buy concessions and stuff like that. I That's see. why you're seeing a lot of uh, movie theaters having like the lounges with the chairs. They have like fucking burgers and like yeah. shakes. They have a bar. Like they're trying to up the ante right. and make you spend as much. Po- I spend more money in concession than I do on the fucking tickets. Right. You know what I mean? But Everyone see, where does. are all these people in the movie high profile people in the movie business actors actresses all these people that make millions of dollars a year yeah. why isn't anybody coming out and being like this is wrong i don't know we I, should at least give the movie theaters 10 percent or I whatever agree. why doesn't anybody fucking say anything i don't know and it's because they're all just they're all just focused on themselves and they just want it but i mean ugh. but then it's like yeah. it's also like you know it, it, specifically in the arts industry it's like People, there are people out there that want to help everyone and do good for everyone. But then it's like at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, you don't really am get I going to not eat right. because I want to help you? You know, it's kind of fucking I think there's a middle slope. ground, you know? Yeah. I think there's a middle ground. It's the same in book publishing. Authors get shit. They oh, yeah. don't get a lot of money sure. I, at I all. believe it. I believe they get it. like maybe 10 or 12% of the profits of a book. I believe it. And that's after the book makes back all of the money that, that it costs yeah. to make it. So they don't get anything. So what about like Stephen King? Like well, some- he does because he's a known quantity. Oh. But like if you're not Stephen King or a best-selling author, you don't have a huge platform. Yeah. Even if you do have a huge platform, you're giving like 90% of your profit to the publishing company. That's insane. Yeah. And really, they're not really doing that much aside from making the book yeah. and doing some publicity. So what you're paying for is really the publicity. And unless you have an amazing... A, 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 unless a publishing house has an amazing publicity team it's not like yeah. or is that w- really worth 90 percent of your profits yeah. so like at the end of my publishing career i would tell authors like you're better do- better off doing this yourself yeah, especially outsources. since amazon now you can publish your own books like i would tell them like do you really want to give 90 percent of your profits to us yeah because we're not gonna do 90 percent of the work yeah so. no, no yeah you know what's funny there's a there's a course there's a way that you can actually become and get that that badge of amazon bestseller um really yeah it's like a little backdoor type thing it's a big thing in like the business world so like you uh, uh like a lot of the martial arts student uh schools yeah. school owners like took a course on it at like my old job he would have the guy who came up with the that sh- sham it's not a yeah. sham it's a it's a legit thing but it's kind of like eh. like huh. what they do is like you'll make this book that's not even like a a, a tangible thing it's like an ebook yeah. right and then like you pick a category that there's like fucking no one in right right and then um for like one day you become uh the, an amazon best-selling author screenshot that motherfucker <laughs> seriously like literally and then you get that social proof of like Oh, that's an Amazon yeah. bestseller. But when you've never actually written a book, published it, like never uh, been legitimate, like you never legitimately like right. made a book. You're not See, an that's, author. See, that's a, that's a scam. And yeah. that's a deviation from what the art of content and sure. bookmaking and filmmaking yep. is like and that's unfortunately the direction that we're like going as a yeah. society that's instant like, like instant uh, gratification, gratification yeah. recognition when you don't fucking deserve it. Yeah. Um Nobody now, I feel like it's very rare to find people who actually have like hustle and they know how to yeah. work hard and they have yeah. a good work ethic. It's yep. like, why do we spend all this energy doing that when you could just, just fucking write the book yeah. and just do the hard work and, and do it for real, do it for real and get the real recognition. Yeah. And if you're not a bestseller, then just accept it. Yep. You know, you're yeah. not a best selling author. Yep. It doesn't mean, you know, why do we need these like fake labels? I know. To I validate us. I know. It's That's a, what drives I get caught crazy. up in that shit sometimes, too. I look at followers. I'm like, oh, I only have. But I'm like, who cares? Like, Right. What does it really mean yeah, at the end like, of the day? Yeah. You know? It's not going to change my life if I had a million followers. You know no, I mean? but if you work hard and you keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, you will. In five years, you that you could have what you think you can never have now. No, you're right. Yep. It's but just got to be consistent. It has to be consistent. And I think at the end of the day, hard work and hustle always pay off 
always. Nice. Yeah. It's true. I believe it too. Yeah. I yeah. believe it. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I totally agree with you and I think yeah. that was a, a good way to, to end the podcast. So yes. thank you so much for allowing me to come to your house and yeah, bumfuck and and <laughs> be on camera and, and audio and, and tell me your kind of Jackie Bundanza story. Now you know who I am. Yeah. Not <laughs> and really, I want to leave. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> You're actually. like, and let's end this. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was nice. I appreciate it. Thanks. So that's another episode of E4 Explosive Podcast. See you next time.